Hello, Houston. We were just sitting here ruminating about the weather. Um, we have been interrupted in our taping by a week, so I'm going to be a little rough getting back into where we were last time. It was a technical glitch on my part that caused the delay. But in any case, um, as best I remember, the last time we were talking about um, specifically the work of, of uh, Kinsey and his colleagues and, and a continuum of sexual orientation that they had developed. And in, in that particular situation, what Kidney, uh, Kinsey had assumed was that homosexuality and heterosexuality were simply polar opposites. You were one or you were the other or some combination between the two. But it was simply A or B and uh, n no blending specifically between them. Um, Michael Storms, uh, in the same general era, the 50s, 60s, 70s, suggested basically, actually it was work in the 70s and 80s, um, suggested that perhaps those two features, homosexuality and heterosexuality and all the things that come along with it, are independent rather than, rather than um, uh, completely being polar opposites. And, and so he was kind of uh, suggesting that the, the Kinsey continuum was really a blending um, not so much simply polar opposites that kind of shared parts with each other. Um, and what he was suggesting was in, in his writing was that, that if, you, if you studied reported erotic fantasies uh, from anyone along the, the continuum from homosexual to uh, heterosexual, Kinsey would have reported um, bisexuals would report less heterosexual, less heteroerotic, I knew I was going to have trouble with all these terms, um, that bisexuals would report less heteroerotic um, fantasies and also less homoerotic fantasies than either pureborn heterosexuals or pureborn homosexuals would do. Storms took a different perspective. What he suggested was that if you want to look at uh, the, the blending of, of homoeroticism and heteroeroticism, he's suggesting that there may be four kind of anchor positions that we could talk about. So a normal homosexual, according to Storms, would be someone who was low on heteroeroticism and high on homoeroticism, interest in it and with a fantasy life of that type. Bisexuals would be high on heteroeroticism and high on homoeroticism. Asexuals would be low on both homo and heteroeroticism. And in fact, heterosexuals would then tend to be high on heteroeroticism and low on homoeroticism. What this kind of an organization leads to, as you can see pretty clearly here, is that Storm both predicted and then confirmed that bisexual people report as many homoerotic fantasies as homosexuals and as many heteroerotic fantasies as heterosexuals. In other words, that they're high on both heteroeroticism and homoeroticism, and thus they have a rich fantasy life in both arenas, uh, in contrast to people who are tending to be exclusively heteroerotic or homoerotic. So the overall conclusion, and this is what I was trying to drive toward the, the end, at the end of, of the last lecture, was that sexual orientation is more complex than just a dichotomy. Our orientation and our behaviors differ. That is, people who think of themselves as heterosexual do sometimes engage in homosexual uh, activities and fantasies. Um, and our erotic desires and behaviors may in fact change as we develop, as we mature. So then let's look specifically at, at uh, homosexuality and, and point out some, some general things about it. First of all, interestingly enough, the American Psychiatric Association defined homosexuality as abnormal until the early 1970s, whereas the American Psychological Association has never done so. Um, the, the modern DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, now considers um, homosexuality abnormal only if the homosexual involved is dissatisfied with their sexual orientation as they experience it. Um, Homosexuals, homosexuals now are being harassed openly, partly due to problems with things like AIDS, which we'll come back and comment on uh, later. But homosexuality is not increasing. It's holding pretty steady statistically if you ask a variety of people about their, their typical orientation and activities. Perhaps no other sexual orientation has been so widely vilified and condemned in society as has homosexuality. Phrases like sick or, or sinful are often applied by people in, in talking in that particular area. 
um, Rathus Nevitt and, and Fichtner Rathus, boy, that's a mouthful of authors, reported on a, on a uh, U.S. survey back in the late 80s that found that basically 75% of respondents in that survey felt sexual relations between members of the same gender are always wrong. 40% would prohibit homosexuals from teaching in a college or a university. That's dropping. It's down from 57% another decade and a half earlier. That is, between early 70s and late 80s, there's been a significant movement, and that is continuing in terms of increasing recognition of homosexuals' ability to contribute, just as a heterosexual would. One of the questions that's been addressed, for instance, is things like, would homosexual teachers molest children? And the answer is, if you look at the data, no. They're, they're no more so likely to do so statistically, they're no more likely to do so statistically than our heterosexual teachers. And it remains a constant that over 90% of all child molestations that occur uh, involve heterosexual males as the initiators of the, um, of the difficulty. Will children raised by homosexuals become homosexuals? Another assertion. And in one study, um, in fact, in, in many recent studies, um, 36 out of 37 children who were raised by homosexual parents uh, became heterosexuals themselves. So when we look then at, at homosexuality strictly in terms of data, uh, it's not a, a, um, a, a, an educational bias that is being reflected there. It's a personal orientation that is really involved. One of the things that is, has had a rather interesting history over the last 30, 40 years has to do with um, sodomy laws, having to do with, with um, various kinds of what, what those laws are targeted at doing is, is prohibiting what are called unnatural acts, even between consenting adults. Such acts would include things like anal intercourse and uh, oral genital contact. Um, Though such laws used to be aimed at prohibiting such acts, um, if you look at the various lawsuits that have been brought or, or suits that have been, have been uh, um, generated here, most of the, um, the majority of trials were targeted specifically at homosexuals. And so then, um, related to that, let me point out just a couple of things here, and that is the 2004 actually saw the election um, of Lupe Valdez as sheriff in, in Dallas County. Um, and she was an open, acknowledged, practicing gay. Uh, it was the first time a, a truly open gay person had been elected to an office, and in fact, she was re-elected in 2008. Um, and of course, in our own, our own city, um, our recent, uh, recently elected mayor in, in 2009 was Anise, uh, is Anise Parker. Um, and she really, it, it, to show how rapidly things are changing in this overall arena, I was, I was very pleased with the fact that she basically simply ignored her sexuality because it really doesn't impact directly one's political office or suitability for it. Um, and in fact, her campaign never mentioned the issue at all. And as a result, um, it didn't occur very much among the critics either. Um, but it, it does show the extent to which we are moving towards societally, toward, toward more comfort uh, in homosexual uh, practices and lifestyle and so forth. Um, so the, the, the question then involves things like uh, specifically cultural stereotypes. Um, and a question is essentially, is a person's sexual orientation intertwined with his or her gender role? Most people would assume so. Um, homosexual men are supposed to be limp-wristed. Uh, homosexual women are supposed to be butch. Um, but something less than 15% um, actually show those characteristics. Do homosexuals divide their house roles, one being housewife, the other being husband, house husband? Um, and the answer basically is no. I did have a comment I meant to drop in earlier when I was talking about sodomy laws, and that is to point out the amazing shift that has taken place here. Prior to 1970, there was only one state where laws against sodomy, if they had ever existed, had been removed, and that was Illinois prior to 1970. Between 1970 and 1989, almost 1990, 25 states had removed laws, uh, anti-sodomy laws. Uh, between 1989 and 2002, another 10 states dropped it, and then the anti-sodomy laws were struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2003, dropping out the last 14 state sodomy laws, including, interestingly enough, Texas. Um, 
And so basically when you, jumping back to where I was talking a minute ago, and that is the roles in, in a household situation, the roles are, are, are typically shared um, among uh, homosexuals. That is, enduring homosexual relationships are not based on traditional husband-wife or masculine-feminine roles at all. Um, do homosexuals divide their sexual roles, one being aggressive, the other passive? No. The roles are basically shared in things like anal intercourse, for example, among males, each will be both inserter and insertee. Um, among uh, females, there's not uh, a traditional femme versus butch split in those kind of relationships either. So when we look then at, at things like genetics and, and homosexuality, uh, good evidence exists that homosexuality does run in families. Um, monozygotic twins, for instance, share homosexuality about 52% of the time. Um, dizygotic, that is fraternal twins, share homosexuality about 22 percent of the time. Um, it seems to play a role in the development, homosexuality seems to play a role in the development of your sexual orientation, but genetics does not directly govern it. Um, the evidence points to a powerful role for genetics, but remember, of course, the twin studies involve people who are typically raised in the same environment. So the question then, um, Michael Storms come back, comes back to ask about uh, the causes of, of homosexuality. And he suggests, among other things, that early matures who are ultimately inclined toward homosexuality turn their sexual attention to those that are most readily available, um, and that is same-sex friends. Those maturing mid to late are already experiencing opposite sex interactions. Um, and so then if we look at the effects of, of hormones and, and homosexuality, um, we know that testosterone is essential in differentiating males from females during gestation. Um, it was long suspected to play a role in influencing males' sexual orientation. The early evidence confirmed this. You kind of find what you're looking for in, in research. Um, more recent and current evidence argues quite strongly against that fact. Um, for both males um, and females, research has failed to demonstrate significant correlations between adult levels of sex hormones and sexual orientation. Um, so that what it's really um, impacting on is cognitive factors and sexual frequency, not um, specifically uh, the partner that you're, you're using. So in males, testosterone does have what is called an activating effect. And by that, what I mean is essentially the inclination of, of sex hormones to influence the level of sex drive, but not sexual orientation. Um, that is exactly what we find. That is that sex hormones affect the level of the sex drive, but they have no demonstrable effects on um, preferring specific partners of either the same or of opposite sex. Prenatally, it's more complex. Um, it may be that hormonal imbalances lead to specific sexual orientations, but that is speculative at the moment. We don't have confirming evidence yet. Um, so then we can also look at, at structural differences in the brain and homosexuality. Um, and we find that Simon LeVay, an investigator, identified a set of cells called the third interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus. I'm going to burden you with details here today. Um, he found that that area, the third interstitial nucleus of the anterior, the front of the hypothalamus, was twice as large in the brains of heterosexual men as in the brains of homosexual men. So there's some limited evidence that, that uh, this size difference may impact one's sexual orientation. But we don't know yet whether this size difference is innate um, in terms of, of um, it, what you're into here, really. It's not necessarily that biology means destiny. Um, it's a chicken and egg controversy. We don't know which comes first. In that, um, in that sequence. But we can look then at things like uh, psychoanalytic uh, perspectives, uh, psychological perspectives and, and homosexuality. And of course for Freud, he jumps right into the battle 50, 100 years ago, arguing that essentially homosexuality results from an unsuccessful resolution of either the Oedipus complex in boys, the lusting after mom, or the Electra complex in, in girls, lusting after their father. And so it means, this means essentially over-identification with mother or father.
and viewing father as the rival for mother's attention from the, uh, from the boy's perspective in that situation. There are some side issues that also factor in here, things like, for instance, castration anxiety, which is caused by a fear of the, uh, of the father, and penis envy, which is caused by resentment of mom, of, of the mother. It leads to, to over-identification with dad, eventually seeking um, sexual gratification from, from the woman, playing as a man in that situation, playing the role of, of uh, a man in that situation. In the last couple of decades, the data does not show that homosexual men tend to report more closeness to their mother than average heterosexual men, uh, and more distance from their father caused by rejecting his overtures because of the child's closeness to mom. That's a lot of words. Let me go back and simplify it. Essentially, the data, I'm sorry, I said not, and that's incorrect. The data does show homosexual men tend to report more closeness to their mom um, and, and more distance from their father. Family characteristics may play a role in this situation because there, there is a great variation among, among the families, the, the types of family situation uh, that homosexuals tend to create. Um, one of the things that's demonstrated, for instance, is, is nonconformity to gender expectations. Uh, many homosexuals report feeling different uh, even early in childhood. In one study, 44 effeminate boys were followed into adulthood uh, and 75% of that group of 44 were either homosexual or bisexual in their orientation once they reached um, adulthood. But roughly a third of, uh, of all homosexuals in one study uh, survey reported no memory at all of being out of sync as a, as a child. So the evidence generally suggests that cross-gender behavior is one possible source encouraging the development of homosexuality. So our conclusion in all of this is essentially that there may be no one cause of sexual orientation. Genetic and biochemical factors, um, hormone levels specifically is what I'm talking about, may affect brain organization prenatally. That's one possible real source there. So then if we look at that, the sexual techniques among homosexuals, um, with the exception of vaginal intercourse, homosexuals, both male and female, um, express themselves sexually with as wide an array of sexual activities as heterosexual couples do. Um, among males, male couples tend to use kissing, hugging, petting, mutual masturbation, fellatio, and anal intercourse. Masters and Johnson's 1979 studies of homosexual male couples uh, caressing their sex partner's bodies before touching the genitals um, was demonstrated. And after hugging and kissing, 75% used oral or manual uh, nipple stimulation. Anal intercourse is also practiced by some, but not all tend to like it. It's clearly on the decline since about 1990, probably because of AIDS. Again, I'll come back to that as a factor later. Uh, the AIDS, I mean. Um, <clears throat> among females, <coughs> excuse me, um, the typical technique uh, of lovemaking includes holding, kissing, and caressing before approaching the genitals. Manual and breast stimulation and manual and oral stimulation of the genitals, the most common techniques among lesbians. Um, they also engage in, in genital apposition, not opposition, apposition. Um, they spend a great deal of time stimulating other parts of, of their partner's body before approaching the breasts and genitals. Most heterosexual males move quickly to stimulate the breasts or move directly to her genitals. Um, the emotional aspect, touching, stroking, cuddling, and hugging, are an important element of the sexual experience in a lesbian relationship. Um, it's less genitally oriented, um, like heterosexual women, than are males. Now, if we look at, at some non-standard uh, sexual activities, uh, they're practiced by few people or with only a low frequency by, at most, a substantial minority. Um, and the, the, the key there seems to be the brain. For a rat, sex means essentially the same act once every few months when the female is in heat. 
for the humans, um, it's an infinite number of, uh, sex is reflected in an infinite number of, of forms. Do it uh, beyond the, ref the um, refractory period, regardless of, of uh, recency of past experience, what was done the last time, whether it's ever been done before. We are basically um, very um, scattered in, in our, um, scattered is maybe a, a more randomly implied word than, than I should use, but we have a broader variety than perhaps any other animal does in, in ways in which the sex act is expressed. Another interesting um, group of, of um, another group of people experiencing orientation, um, sexual orientation, is, is uh, transsexualism, in which there is typically an evidence of a gender identity problem. And so what a, a transsexual is considered to be is simply a male or a female who believes that they are trapped in the body of a person of the opposite sex. Individuals who seek to become members of the opposite sex because that is where their gender identity lies would qualify as a, as a transsexual. The feeling that their personality resides within a wrong sexed body often develops during childhood. Um, and they may spend a significant proportion of their life uh, lives um, as a member of the opposite sex. Um, and some, in the extreme instance, as they approach adulthood, will tend to seek sex change operations. It's not sought casually, and it's not offered casually. Um, typically, what such a person would have to do is to, to endure, endure, experience perhaps a two-year test um, in which they're undergoing hormonal treatment to shift the sexual balance within them. Um, and then they also have to exhibit a, uh, engage in a real life uh, as someone of the opposite sex, dressing in as the opposite sex and so forth. And so really kind of the key question that's being addressed by that kind of an approach is essentially, is this someone with other psychological problems? But assuming those can be, can be um, addressed and, and uh, removed as, as a causative event, um, there are procedures by which people can be gradually shifted with psychological experience um, into um, the opposite sex from what they were born. So then let's look at um, the, the eighth section here as we get into it and look at, well, number seven, I guess, is what we're, we're approaching. The, what I'm looking at is essentially the second half of, of the development of, of sexuality. And there, I'm going to pose some questions to you as, as uh, mostly normal heterosexuals. And let me ask you a question. What is the ideal? What are the ideal features? If you were to describe your ideal date, man or woman, how would you describe it? So for you men, what I'd like to ask you to think of for a minute is, is the following. What are the most important attributes for you in describing your ideal sexual partner? Okay, what is desired in women by men? And ladies, lest you think you're gonna get away here, let me pose for the women that you think a minute about the following. That is, what is the most important attribute for you in describing your ideal sexual partner? And as I give you a minute to think about that, let me set the stage here that what I'm gonna do is to review uh, what several surveys have revealed among women naming off or listing the ideal features for men and also men listing the ideal features for women. Um, and you may be surprised, in fact I was as I looked at the, the, the two lists and I um, developed some extra visuals around this as you'll see here in just a minute. But for instance, if we look at features that are desired in women by men, you get a list like the following. Build and figure for males is number one on a five point rating scale. Number two is sexuality. Number three is attractiveness. And from there on, look at what happens. Facial features, buttocks, weight, legs, breath, skin, chest, and breasts. If you look at it, in essence, you can see some rather interesting features, and that is that everything from number four down is a physical feature. It doesn't have anything to do with, with anything other than physique. Now, before you women walk away smirking, let's look at your side of the, of the picture here. Features desired in men by women. And here what we find is, number one is attractiveness. Number two is sexuality. Some degree of similarity there to the men. Number three is warmth. And look at what happens to your list from number four onward. Personality, tenderness, gentleness, sensitivity, kindness, build and figure, yes, 
and character. And in that case, what I would suggest is that aside from the, the three that we'll come back and talk about here in a minute, everything else tends to deal with um, behavior, essentially. And so if you look at it, if you put them side by side, um, some rather interesting differences, similarities first of all, show up. Um, and that is from the male side, build and figure, which is number one, is way down on the list for, for features that women seek in men. We're right on, on par with each other in terms of sexuality. And in fact, with attractiveness, there's only a two rank difference as to the, the importance of that. But if you remove those three features, look at what's left. And that is among, among features that are desired by men in women. They're very heavily physical in their orientation. And if you look at the features desired in men by women, their features are very behavior oriented, more so than, than physically oriented in that, um, in that list. And so males emphasize physique, females tend to emphasize behaviors. And despite all those differences, one of the things that, that strikes me in this, in this overall section is that if you look at comparability of, of, uh, fe of features, male and female, um, males and females are remarkably similar to one another. Male humans and male and female humans are remarkably similar to one another. The brains have minor differences, but they're functionally identical in terms of which area controls which function in you and I, whether male or female. Medical conditions that are treatable in you and I are essentially identical. The organs are interchangeable. Nervous systems are very close to identical. Observation of, of sexual, derivation I should say, of sexual organs shows differing components but they develop from the same prenatal tissue. Let me pose a problem for you, as a, given what I'm headed into here, and that is, suppose a Martian were to land on, on, on our soil here, um, and he found two humans, one each sex, and two apes, one each sex. How would he tend to cluster them together? How would he group them? I would argue that, in fact, what he would, what he would tend to do, he would be much more likely to put the human with the human than the males with the males, even though there's a substantial difference in, in how we look. Um, but he would tend to stress the, the differences. That he, we stress the differences, but the similarities are really much more striking when you look at men versus women. And if we go back and look specifically at anatomy, um, I'm not going to go through all these in terms of, of teaching them to you by any means, but I just wanted to point out, for instance, that if you look at where the various male and female sex organs and parts of sex organs come from, there's a remarkable similarity both in terms of their structure and what they do for us um, in terms of where they come from. So the bud that will eventually become the, the glands of the female clitoris becomes the glands or head of the, of the male penis. Um, the lateral buttress um, becomes the, the shaft of the female clitoris, and it also becomes the shaft of the penis, depending on whether it's man or woman, or boy or girl that is, is developing. That depends essentially on the chromosomes, the chromosomal composition at conception. That is, it's, it's an X and Y chromosome for males, and it's two X chromosomes for, for females. But the result is that things like the labial scrotal swelling um, in the growing uh, fetus becomes the scrotum of the male, and it becomes the labia majora of the female. Um, the, the, within the, the scrotum tissue, um, what develops out of that is the testes in the male, uh, and it becomes the ovaries in the, in the female. The testicles produce spermatozoa, the male uh, sex cells. The female's ovaries, on the other hand, generate ova, or eggs, the female sex cells. These testicles and ovaries collectively are called gonads in both males and females, and they essentially produce the male and female sex hormones. So they're similar in form at the start, and yet they're quite different at maturation. And yet, the similar function remains. It's still there. For male, uh, manipulation of the head of the penis is arousing and pleasurable. For the female, manipulation of the head of the clitoris is arousing and pleasurable. Um, and the same is true for both sexes of the of manipulation of, of the two end products of the of the shaft. So if we look then at the the sexual response cycle here, um, 
my reason for going into this is simply partly because it isn't covered very much in, in, the, um, in the book that we're using, and yet it is uh, reasonably important in adolescent lives, and there's some evidence to suggest that knowledge of sexual function and parts is, is on the decline at the moment. Uh, so I'm gonna, this will be a strike to correct that if possible. Um, Masters and Johnson did the classic work in this area, uh, an extraordinarily detailed study starting in the, in the 60s and, and stretching into the 70s at least. Um, and they studied basically the human sexual physiology in, in a remarkable way. Um, there are two common processes that underlie the four-stage sexual response cycle that they eventually uh, proposed and, and documented. And that is um, that when sexual simulation first starts in both sexes, the net result is two processes that occur. One of these is what's referred to as vasocongestion, and that is blood flowing into the genitals, which engorges them uh, for the male and the female in different ways, as we'll get to here in a few minutes. But, uh, but that's a resulting, the result of a process called vasocongestion. Um, the other thing that experience, is experienced by, by both men and women is what is called neuromuscular tension. And that is essentially a buildup of energy in the muscles and nerves in the genital area. Um, the, the four elements of the, of the sexual response cycle proposed and developed by, by Masters and Johnson, documented I should say, not developed by them, documented is a better word to use, um, is caused by a wide variety of different types of, of experiences. Um, Tight-fitting clothes can produce vasocongestion and neuromuscular tension. Observing two animals locked in intercourse. Sitting at a small desk. That's the perpetual problem of middle high school males. And that is the desks that are simply pressing down on their genitals will have predictable effects. Viewing an erotic movie or pornography is sexually arousing for both members of both sexes. Watching rock singers, this is one that is especially um, reported by, by women. Watching rock singers tends to be sexually arousing. Think about, thinking about any of the above that I've mentioned can be sexually arousing. The net result is in excitement that men will have erections. Women will experience warmth and pulsing in the genital area. And if you look at the other kind of things that go on, a man's erection will begin typically a few seconds after sexual stimulation uh, begins. This is caused by the, the same vasocongestion that also occurs in, in women. Uh, it's not caused by muscle action or a stiffening bone. That is not what's going on there. Uh, the penis is composed of spongy tissue that is pumped full of blood. Um, some clown actually suggested that he was weakened by the experience. So much blood went into his penis, but we won't get into that kind of discussion. Um, nipples of the breast may become erect in, the, um, in a male. Lubrication occurs uh, through secretion of a clear liquid uh, through the urethral opening, uh, which I'll come back and talk about here in a few minutes. But that, that takes time. Um, the, the overall sex act itself does take time, uh, and the, the typical male, particularly young male, tendency to rush the act is not beneficial um, so much to his pleasure and, uh, and certainly to her pleasure. Um, women, on the other hand, um, I forgot I had all these wonderful terms to share with you. Women um, will in fact display lubrication of the vagina, which is the canal extending inward from the vaginal opening to the uterus. Uh, it's forced from the vaginal walls by that vasocongestion, which is in fact occurring. Um, and so the, the effect of the swelling of the walls is to force lubricating fluids out into the canal itself. Um, the amount varies from woman to woman, not necessarily related to her level of excitation or excitement. Um, what happens is that as the, as the excitation continues, uh, the vagina expands and lengthens. The uterus tends to pull upward. Um, the labia majora swell and spread. Those are the lips that can be seen from the outside. The labia minora swell and also spread. The clitoris enlarges the nipples of the breast become erect. 
and the areola, which is the area surrounding the nipples, may swell, they may as much as double in size uh, under conditions of, of sexual arousal. Um, breasts may also increase in size, in some cases quite substantially, during um, situations of, of uh, sexual arousal, heightened sexual arousal. Um, there is one difference, male to female, uh, among the, the uh, structures that I'm talking about here, and that is that the urethral opening and the vagina, vaginal opening are separated in women. That is, the opening uh, serves both purposes uh, in men. One opening serves both purposes in men. But a male cannot urinate, as I'll show you a little bit later, there is a shutoff of, of the um, uh, access to, to, the, um, to urine uh, in the case of, of heightened arousal. Um, if you think about it a minute, when you've seen a fully aroused man, the stream would land about 30 feet away if we were capable of, of uh, uh, urinating when, when uh, fully aroused. Um, neither men nor women are instantly aroused. That is, the, the latency issue is, is uh, uh, probably socially helpful, but it, it simply deals with the fact that neither men nor women react instantly in terms of, of any kind of momentary sexual arousal, whether it's an image or anything that happens to happen in a given situation. The latency varies widely both within and between various men and women. Um, traditionally, women tend to be somewhat slower in, in responding to sexual stimulation. Um, and there's, there's a long kind of uh, historical analysis of that, that that goes on. It, it's again, it's almost a chicken and egg kind of controversy, but there is some reason to suspect that uh, males are, are predominantly um, propagated to, to um, they are very much inclined toward, toward spreading seed as far and wide as possible, increasing the likelihood that they will produce uh, um, progeny uh, through the inter, uh, intercourse. Um, women, on the other hand, because they are traditionally, and this has gone back for eons, um, typically responsible for the children that are ultimately produced, tend to be a lot slower in being aroused to the situation where they can produce children, simply because if, if the net result is uh, pregnancy, they're going to be uh, the ones responsible for the, for the results of that. So there's some thought kind of uh, from a different, a, a cognitive uh, direction to suggest that there may be a very specific reason for the difference in immediacy of arousability, men versus women. In any case, after excitement, the next, um, well, in fact, this is the way it plots on, on the, um, sorry about that, let me go back and review here that the, this is the way the, the curve actually looks for females in terms of plotting degree of arousal, which is what's plotted on the, on the y-axis here. The x-axis, as it turns out, will be a timeline uh, from initiating the, the act until uh, full completion. And among males, the curve is exactly the same. Um, in, in moving through the arousal stage. It is a relatively temporary stage, that as you move from, from excitement into uh, the next stage, which is plateau, um, in, in some cases in a relatively few seconds, uh, certainly in not more than, than several minutes, and a plateau actually occurs. Uh, at this point, the, the uh, sex organs are, are actually fully engorged um, in both men and women, and a high level of sexual tension can be achieved during this state. What, what you're engaged in is what is typically called foreplay, um, and that means essentially that this state can be maintained from several minutes to literally several hours. One form of, of sexual satisfaction uh, sometimes reported is among men and women who have maintained themselves at a very high state of arousal, in some cases for several hours, and the report from those uh, such people is, is that the uh, net result is as satisfying as the full act, sex act itself, even though they do not achieve a true orgasm, as we'll get to here a little bit later. So foreplay means essentially the state of, of uh, playing uh, with the sex organs of, of the person with whom you're engaged in the act. Penis size in this act is much less important than men think. Uh, for several reasons. One is the fact that vaginal tissues swell and the opening to the vagina decreases to about one-third of its original size upon arousal. The vagina and the, the vagina, I should say, and the, the opening conform to the size of the entering penis regardless of its magnitude. Um, secondly, 
Penises in a flaccid or non-erect state vary tremendously in size, stress the word tremendously. Limb state size uh, does not predict uh, the size at erection in any way. Uh, women worry about the size of, of their vagina, forgetting that it's large enough when relaxed to permit the passage of an entire baby. Um, Men also should not worry. Um, I read somewhere one time that it's the, not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog that's really most important. Um, so in terms of size issues on both sides, we don't need to worry about it. Set it aside as anything to be concerned with. Um, in women, um, the glands of the clitoris is covered by the clitoral hood which corresponds to the foreskin of the, um, of the penis. And the purpose of the, of the uh, clitoral hood is to protect the clitoris from, from stimulation. Stimulation of the mons veneris, which is the, the hair-covered mound um, above, physically above the clitoris, and of the clor cl clitoral shaft, remains very pleasurable. Um, the labia minora swell, pushing aside the outer lips, the labia majora, and increasing accessibility to the vagina during the course of, of sexual stimulation. Change in their coloration is an excellent predictor of orgasm. Um, pink to bright red in women who, are not, who have not previously been uh, pregnant at the time of, of uh, the particular sex act, and from bright red to deep wine in those who have been previously um, pregnant. Um, I was wondering as I read and wrote this lecture how on earth you're supposed to check that if you're engaged in, in the sex act itself, but leave it to Masters and Johnson to figure all that out. Um, the areoli continue to, um, spread, uh, to swell. Uh, it may cause the nipples in some cases to seem non-erect, though they are simply because of the magnitude of the swelling that the areola uh, is engaged in or is, is experiencing. 75% um, of women display a sex flush on their upper abdomen, spreading sometimes to the neck, the back, um, and other parts of the body. It's a reddish, spotty spin, uh, skin coloration uh, condition, and it results basically from changes in the blood flow pattern uh, created by the, the sexual arousal. Um, if we look at males in this, uh, in, during the plateau stage, the head of the penis uh, expands and deepens in color. The coronal ridge, which is at the, the bottom of the head toward the, um, toward the shaft, um, fans out, spreads out, um, and makes the glands look like a soldier's battle helmet with a dent on one side. Um, it may aid in vaginal stimulation, that expansion of the, of the coronal ridge. Robin Williams uh, commented on that one time to talk about uh, the erect penis within its scrotum looks like a snail marching in battle dress. Um, where he got that imagery, I don't know, but that's his description of it. Um, the, what's, what's happening in, in the case of, of arousal is simply that the normally uh, wrinkled and, and um, um, placid uh, penis extends straight out and slightly upward, but that can vary tremendously. Some extend upward as much as 40, at, a, at as much as a 45 degree angle. Um, others curve left or right or up or down. Any significant deviation from straight ahead or slightly upward tends to worry both owners and sometimes their lovers. Um, it matters not because basically the, the penis is hinged at the body. There's no bone extending inward from the, from the penis, and therefore it can be moved to a position allowing insertion into a vagina. Um, the, the aroused uh, but non-inserted resting position is simply as irrelevant to, to the ability to perform the sex act itself. What does happen is that the scrotum tends to elevate noticeably toward the body. The testicles pull in toward the body. Uh, and fully ele full elevation uh, is predictive of uh, an immediate or short about to occur orgasm. Uh, during elevation and while fully erect, um, the penis emits a clear lubricating fluid in response to stimulation. And as with women, it takes some degree of, of uh, manual manipulation to achieve that, uh, but it is, uh, it is helpful to the overall sex act itself. It is important to be aware of the fact that this fluid does contain sperm. And the net result is then that things like coitus interruptus is not, underline not, an effective means of birth control because of the fact that, that um, 
uh, a penis um, when engaged in, in the sex act itself in, uh, within the vagina is in fact oozing fluids as uh, with the action that's involved there and that fluid does contain sperm. So pregnancy is possible even though you're telling uh, yourself that, uh, well, if, if um, he pulls out before, before orgasm, no pregnancy will occur. Not true. Don't believe that. Feelings of warmth and pressure often are experienced in the pelvic area for, for, um, for men during heightened arousal. Uh, and for both men and women, several other things are going on. Heart rate and blood pressure tend to increase during heightened sexual arousal. Um, breathing rate will be faster, and the muscles of the buttocks and the thighs become especially tense. Um, the net result will be then that it's going to look like this during the plateau stage for females. Um, in one pattern, I'll talk about a couple of others here in a few minutes. Um, in the male, the pattern is very similar. That is, you're brought to uh, an aroused state uh, and you can be held. The reason for the dotted line there is it depends on, on the length of time that you wish to participate uh, and mutually stimulate um, your partner um, as to how long the, the plateau state will, will last. Um, the third state in this situation that will be shortcoming here is orgasm. Um, what that results in is a sudden discharge of sexual tension, uh, often called climax. Uh, it lasts only a few seconds for both sexes, typically accompanied by five to seven waves of very intense pleasure. One writer described it as an explosion of sexual tension. A release of energy is, is clearly what's involved there. And it involves uh, rhythmic contractions of the pelvic region. Um, intense pleasurable feelings, um, lack of thoughts, and followed by complete relaxation following the, the orgasm. The quality or nature of the orgasm varies widely and it's affected by many things, some of which may not have struck you before, but they, it's affected by, for instance, the quality of the lover's relationship itself in things other than sex. Things like fatigue or, or rested state can impact the, the nature of the orgasm. Depression or elation, at the time the love is being, being expressed, high or low expectations, um, degree of sexual experience, all of those can impact the, the magnitude of the, of the enjoyment and various processes associated with the orgasm itself. Do we differ, men and women, in orgasm? There's no firm way to answer that, but, but one of the most interesting tests of that that I've ever seen was somebody who went into a, um, a, a um, a male-female situation where it was appropriate to be asking that and what he asked the, the participants, both men and women, to do was to write a description of how they experienced orgasm. And it was interesting that if you separated the men, uh, uh, sorry, the name from the description, when you read them you could not tell them apart unless a, unless a specific body part was mentioned which was directly tied to men or woman, you couldn't tell. And, and when you tried to separate them, it was just as easy to, to end up with a male description of orgasm in the female stack or a female's in the male stack. That's the best evidence we have um, psychologically that, that the orgasm that men and women experience is essentially identical. It's behaviorally very similar. Um, for women um, in this situation, orgasms may begin in the clitoris and, and spread through the entire body. Uh, reports of genital and pelvic warming, tingling, and, and pelvic throbbing are quite common in this situation. One key difference, as we'll get to here in a minute in the diagram, involves the fact that a, an orgasm among women, uh, within a woman, I should say, um, may involve anywhere from 3 to 15 contractions of the uterus, roughly one second apart. There is, of course, no ejaculation or sudden discharge of fluids. Um, one interesting question is, are there actually different types of orgasms in women? And, and the, the answer is that it depends on who you're looking at, um, reading, I should say. Uh, Freud, on one hand, was arguing in favor of the idea that there are clitoral orgasms, and he contrasted that with what he called vaginal orgasms, which were Freud, for Freud, were, were essentially a slightly different location, but what they reflected, according to Freud, was, was uh, maturity. Um, no other evidence in, in favor of, of his distinction there. Another group, the Singers, in, in the mid-1970s, were arguing in favor of not 
two but three different types of, of um, uh, orgasm uh, among women. One was what is called what they called vulval. Um, uh, orgasm in which they were talking about contractions of the vaginal barrel as being the main source of, of the orgasm. They suggested then you could move into or experience what are called uterine orgasms, which are from deep penal thrusting against the, um, against the cervix, including things like gasping or gulping for air, holding of breath, explosive release, um, and deep feelings of relaxation and sexual satisfaction in that second type of, of uh, orgasm. And in fact, they argued then that you could move into a blended um, type of orgasm, which draws somewhat from both the vulval and the uterine description of what's going on. Masters and Johnson, on the other hand, some years later, simply concluded there is only one type. Despite some of these glorious descriptions, there is really no demonstrable difference uh, in the type of orgasm that, that women tend to tend to experience. One of the rather interesting side effects that, that this research has gotten into has to do with what's called the Grafenberg spot. Uh, it's named for a gynecologist, Ernest Grafenberg, in 1950. He published evidence that what, what he was arguing was that on the anterior wall of the, of the vagina, um, anterior as opposed to posterior, on the anterior wall of the vagina, perhaps two knuckles in, um, that's one to two inches in from the, from the outer opening, um, manipulating that spot supposedly yields intense pleasure and sometimes a form of female ejaculation, a sugar-rich fluid. Um, that's similar in, in description to the way the singers describe their uterine orgasm. It is controversial. Some doctors find it in 100% of, of various reported samples ranging from uh, a sample of 27 up to as much as 400 women in certain studies. Others say the whole area is richly sensitive. Um, me, I would argue that it seems strange that with thousands of years of billions of men and women engaging in sexually stimulating women, that the G-spot wasn't discovered until 1950. That just seems to me to be the strongest argument against the existence of a, of a separate identifiable Grafenberg spot. I've not seen any convincing evidence. For men, we're easy. We are going to lead into, as we get to orgasm, what is called ejaculatory inevitability. What happens from the male side is that, that uh, the males are simply no longer able to control the expulsion of fluids. The prostate, prostrate gland, pro, I'll say it right, prostate gland and seminal vesicles inject fluid into the canal, which is extending to the opening at the head of the penis. Both are located in the neck of the bladder and jointly produce seminal, cloudy, dense, viscous fluid. Uh, spermatozoa travel from testes to a union of the prostate and seminal vesicle. And the net result then is ejaculation, which is essentially um, the opening at the neck of the bladder closes prior to ejaculation, which prevents urine from entering these fluids. Uh, but it results in an expulsion of these fluids, as I've just described them, from the head of the penis with some, some, discre some degree of force, uh, the intent being to put the sperm as far as possible into uh, the woman with whom uh, sex is being engaged. There are reports of, of genital and pelvic warming also among males, tingling and pelvic throbbing similar to what women report. And the net result is that if you look at the, the curve that is involved uh, for females, you have the, the following situation, and that is orgasm will, will eventually arrive. Uniquely with females, there are a couple of other things that may happen. One is, for instance, the fact that a second orgasm may in fact be endured, um, not hours later, but in fact minutes later. Uh, with, with a cooperating partner, uh, the net result can be that a, a second orgasm uh, is, is achievable uh, in, the, in the seconds, minutes immediately following the initial orgasm. Um, assuming it's only going to be, oh, sorry, we're going to go over and look at the male now. And again, we're easy there is an orgasm.
We lead then into, I'm pausing because I'm trying to think if there's another set of information I want to give you, but I guess it's after the next set, so we'll rush ahead here. And that is in resolution, when we're looking at, at the, the what's going on, there, there are some significant differences, um, men versus women, as to how resolution goes on in both sexes when resolution ultimately occurs, and keep that comment in mind. What happens is that the blood flows away from the genitalia, um, the sex flush disappears, Heavy breathing gradually subsides, and the heart rate returns essentially to normal. That's in during what is called resolution, which is defined simply as the return to an unaroused state, including a refractory period in males, which I'll come back and talk about here in a uh, in a minute. Um, in fact, for women, um, a rather interesting process occurs, and that is you, you move then into resolution, which is as described here a minute ago. Um, the breast areola and nipple return to normal size in this situation, as does the clitoris. The labia loses its ruddy color and the vagina shortens. Stimulation of the labia and clitoris, in fact, now may be quite uncomfortable for a female in the, in the stage, in the resolution stage. Um, there are two other processes that we should also mention here, and, and I it wasn't quite sure where to put them in this, so I'll simply do it here during the resolution stage. And that is that there are at least two other, the reason there was an A under the pattern of, uh, at the, that we've just finished talking about here is that it's not rating the quality of any one, it's simply a, a differentiating label. The A pattern, as we've just described, is by far the most typical, uh, describing perhaps um, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of all women are engaged in the, in the A pattern. The C pattern is quite different, and that is that what happens is that in, in someone who is capable of uh, achieving the C pattern, um, she moves through excitement to plateau and then into one lengthy extended orgasm, being perhaps three times as long as, as the normal orgasm, followed by an equally rapid resolution. And the entire process, start to finish, in the C pattern, as I've described it there, is perhaps two minutes from start to finish. I know of only one instance in, in a movie uh, where I have seen that depicted. Uh, and in that case, the entire process took less than a minute, start to finish. So the, the C pattern, which is unusual, uh, the lowest frequency of the three I'm going to talk about here, um, is nonetheless quite intense in, in the pleasure that females report who, who are capable of or can do that kind of a, uh, an, an experience. And the, the resolution suggests, perhaps better than anything else, the, the satisfying nature of it. That is, the drive itself is fully satisfied by someone who experiences the C pattern, but it is unusual in its, in its frequency of occurrence. The other pattern, which we should also mention, is the B pattern which in fact suggests that uh, she is brought through excitement to plateau and held 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 and finally the hell with it. And that is in fact what's happened there is the sex drive has not been satisfied witness the, the relative slowness with which resolution occurs. The, the processes that I was describing for the sex organ occur over a much more extended period of time in the, uh, in the B pattern. And if you ask uh, women afterwards, uh, or any time for that matter, to describe the, the, uh, the B pattern when they've experienced it, uh, it is not described as a particularly satisfying, much more frustrating process to, to experience, um, uh, to move through. And that is simply because the, the orgasm itself is a, is a pressure release. It's, it's a sex drive satisfaction being reflected by that process. And the absence of it in the B pattern means essentially that that's the reason you have the more extended resolution phase, because the sex drive has not been satisfied in that situation. The sadness is that almost every woman who, who engages in ultimately an, an active sex life has gone through the B pattern. It tends to occur, first of all, in, in first intercourse, Oftentimes, because of her own inexperience, she doesn't know what she's really reaching for, um, and or she has a male who is equally naive, um, and in fact um, is more concerned about himself than, than the person with whom he is engaged in, in the sex act. And the result is the males are in a rush. They're, they're, their their uh, A pattern uh, looks almost like the the C pattern described here for females. Um, 
and and the net result unfortunately in both cases uh, shortens the length of time of intercourse and increases the odds that the female will, will experience the the B pattern as, as described there it's not a particularly enjoyable one for for her and if we look then at the resolution phase in terms of, of men, um, what's going on in that case is that the, um, the penis becomes limp because orgasm pumps blood out of, the, of, out of its tissues back into the bloodstream itself. Uh, and because blood flow, um, as a result of that, the blood flow returns to normal and um, the, the male loses uh, his erection. Uh, the testes decrease in size and they tend to descend to normal position during the resolution phase. Uh, it is possible with um, a cooperating partner to engage in um, experience an orgasm again a second time, but because of the refractory period that we were talking about a minute ago, uh, it typically will not occur rapidly. It will be something that you have to, um, you have to uh, with a cooperating partner, um, it will take some degree of, of uh, re-stimulation in order to achieve that second orgasm. Question. Hi. Um, you were talking about the sexual patterns between uh, the men and women and the several different patterns that women ex uh, exhibit A, B, and C. Is it possible that they're learned or can be taught or is it completely innate? And do women do these things naturally and do men do these patterns naturally and only, and only in one way or do they learn them? Good question. It's a complex one to answer. I will get you an answer to the, to the difference between the A and C pattern as I was describing it a minute ago. Give me just a second and I can back up to the curves we were talking about. There we go. Um, the, the difference between the A pattern, which is by far the most common one uh, among sexually mature women, um, the, the one question, the one aspect of your question I'm not going to be able to answer is whether the, the C is in fact uh, genetic. I could see ways in which it could be not inborn but learned. Um, simply because of the, the very satisfying nature of that more extended orgasm. Um, the difference between the A, which again is the most common pattern, and the B pattern um, is that the B pattern is the second most frequent pattern and that results from particularly the, the um, lack of knowledge of the woman and or the lack of experience of her partner or simply the lack of caring that in fact women traditionally take longer to move through to the point where they're ready for uh, an orgasm and particularly if the male is in a rush it reduces the likelihood that an organism is going to occur so I would I would um, I think easily be able to justify the idea that the A pattern uh, say that again that the B pattern is essentially resulting from either inexperience or lack of attention uh, and so in that case I would argue that the B pattern is strictly the result of either learning or lack of learning uh, that it, it's um, it is only inborn to the extent that the the lack of stimulation will produce the B pattern uh, but it, it's really um, operating at that level is is uh, a behavioral problem predominantly not not inborn per se there's nothing that requires that the B pattern be the result it's simply um, lack of experience or, or lack of attention to to uh, length of stimulation I'll have to go check on on the uh, innate aspects of C that's that's an interesting question and I don't know the answer to it but I'll get it for you by the beginning of the uh, next lecture um, back to me again for a second let me get ahead to where I wanted to be here okay now, we can also look at a variety of, of um, other ways in which uh, sexual expression can be, uh, can, or sexual, the sex act can in fact be expressed. Um, one of these involves non-genital sources of, of sexual pleasure. Remember in our, in our comments earlier on the, to the effect of how much time um, members of homosexual couples spend stimulating and manipulating parts of, of their partner's body other than the genitals. Remembering that, um, for men, um, in that same context, uh, massaging their nipples can be very stimulating, uh, whether in a homosexual or a heterosexual coupling. Um, for both men and women, massaging and rubbing the feet um, or the tummy can also be very stimulating. It is a form of sexual stimulation that, that one learns one's way into. It does not happen uh, naturally in and of itself as, as the thing to do. But really practice and experience are the best determinants of what gives your partner the greatest arousal and satisfaction. So that is one among many 
um, varieties of sexual experience that you can learn your way into. Secondly, we have the, the uh, standard uh, sex-related activities, and, and that, of course, um, is described by penal vaginal intercourse, and that is practiced by 90% approximately of North Americans. Um, almost 100% of those who are married will report that their intercourse is, is of the um, vaginal penal insert um, variety. The missionary position, so-called, in which the male is on top and reclining uh, is by far the most common. The question is, is it the most popular? Not so much data on that. Um, but given the, the nature of the male and female physiology, there are a lot of different um, forms in which the sex act itself can be presented. The woman may be on top in the missionary position, and by that what I mean is, is the reclining position, um, where a woman is normally on bottom, man on top, uh, it's just as easy to switch the, the roles so the female is on top as opposed to the male. Um, they both may stand and engage in intercourse. Uh, that is to a certain extent obviously impacted by the height of, of man and woman involved. Um, man may be seated with woman in his lap facing toward or away from him um, on the side of the bed. Uh, they can be side by side in bed. Um, she may be seated on the side of the bed and he may be on his knees in front of her. That's another possibility. She may be on all fours, allowing insertion from behind, though some women object to this because of the implied domination of the male over and surrounding her during the sex act itself and, and the uh, obvious tie to, to lower animal forms engaging in, in sex in that way. So it isn't quite so appealing, uh, particularly to women, as a, um, as a form. There are hundreds of variations mixing any part or several of the various things that I have, have described here. Surveys indicate that those who engage in a variety of, of sexual activities um, tend to be more comfortable with their sexuality itself. That is, they are more sexually oriented and, and comfortable in that situation. I was going to have to get to it at some point, and masturbation is the topic. Woody Allen had a very nice quote about masturbation. What he said was, I don't knock masturbation, it's sex with someone I love. And that kind of summarizes the act. In, in 1758, an author by the name of Samuel Tissot, uh, a Swiss physician, wrote a book called Onania, or a treatise upon the disorders produced by masturbation. In that book, he wrote at length about the masturbation being a dangerous habit which produces pimples, blisters, constipation, consumption, blindness, insomnia, headaches, genital cancer, feeble-mindedness, weakness, jaundice, nose pain, intestinal disorders, confusion, insanity, I love the summary, and a host of rather grotesque maladies. If the previous list isn't a list of grotesque marity, maladies, I'd hate to see what he had in mind. Um, during World War I, uh, the soldiers at that time, through lack of knowledge, were, were warned about masturbation, that it would sap their energy and otherwise reduce their masculinity, the army being concerned about that, obviously. Um, and they actually used chemicals to reduce the urge uh, toward masturbation, uh, as might happen in, in a male-male um, foxhole. Um, writers at the time, the very few who mentioned it, actually suggested that it caused everything from warts on the offending hand to insanity. Um, very little evidence uh, supporting that now. Um, remedies? Savage. In one case, acid on the clitoris is one possibility. Uh, suturing the foreskin or circumcision um, without anesthesia is another way in which uh, uh, some societies have dealt with uh, reducing the likelihood of participating in mas masturbation. It's now considered quite normal uh, in the medical um, field, um, and in fact it's also been observed that even animals do it. Um, if we look at the frequency with which sex is, is engaged in, um, I should have put that word on the screen and I forgot to, but in any case, um, since the Kinsey report in 1948, all the way up through modern reports just in the last 10 years or so. Um, it has been interesting to watch the, the acknowledged percentage of males and females who engage in either masturbation or intercourse itself has been growing steadily. 
I strongly suspect that the act itself is not increasing in frequency. What is uh, probably more responsible for that is the fact that, that um, um, more people are feeling comfortable with social research. It's become more fashionable in the last 50 years to ask questions and to ask even impertinent personal questions in some situations. Um, and people are more comfortable with that kind of data now than, than they used to be. And so that's probably uh, accounting for the seeming increase in, in sexual activity. There's very little other evidence to suggest that the, the frequency is going up. Um, in the most recent reports, 95% of all males will acknowledge uh, things like masturbation. Uh, and some say that the other 5% are simply lying. Uh, among females, it's more difficult to tell um, what is actually occurring. Modern surveys suggest that perhaps 70%, perhaps even 80% have masturbated at least once during the course of their life. And a, a study within the last 15 years or so reported that 95% of men and 85% of women reported that they had masturbated. In that same study, 71% of the women, now this study is about mm, 10 years old at this point, um, in that same study then, 71% of the women and 83% of the men reported having masturbated within the previous three months. Why the difference? Interesting to consider. One possibility is simply that the protruding penis may invite more manual manipulation in contrast to the relatively hidden uh, clitoris. Um, males are kind of constantly reminded of the fact that they have a sex organ between their legs when they're sitting down in pants pinch, uh, when they themselves pinch themselves because their legs crush inappropriately in a given situation, and so forth. So they, the, you, because of its location, the male sex organ may in fact just call attention to itself more often. Um, and yet, um, by contrast, among, among females, manipulation of the clitoris and the labia seems to be preferred to manipulating the vagina, per se. Cultural norms may encourage females to suppress sexual interests and lead to the expectation of less interest by females in masturbation. There's no particular, in, and no particular documentation that that is in fact a, a true assessment of what's going on. But in addition, for, for females, um, masturbation, masturbation may be likely to lead to intense orgasms and to multiple orgasms when it's uh, being participated in. And what that leads to then is, is less frequently experienced need to relieve oneself of sexual tensions. Uh, so that is another possibility as to, as to why the, the data is pretty clear cut that um, fewer women tend to masturbate and women in terms of frequency are less often likely to do so than, than males. Um, now we get to the, the oral sex. Um, I forgot the frequency date word that I should have put in there. Uh, within the last uh, 20 years or so, James Stover was acquitted. This is an interesting sequence of legal consequences here. James Stover was acquitted of forcing a woman to perform oral sex on him. And yet later in the same state, he was convicted of sodomy for admitting that that had occurred. So he was uh, declared innocent in one situation and, and then declared guilty in, in the other situation. As I was saying earlier, the sodomy laws have now been stricken from the books by um, Supreme Court action. So in terms of oral sex, how often, by whom, the data is quite clear cut. High educational and income levels equal high likelihood of having participated in oral sex. Almost 80% of males had performed cunnilingus, which is oral stimulation of, of the clitoris in one study about 15 years ago. Over 80% of females had performed fellatio, which is, is oral stimulation of the, um, of the penis. Nearly 80% of women uh, had received cunnilingus, uh, and over 80% of, of males sampled had received uh, fellatio. Um, for Southern Baptist students, um, 35% of the females and 55% of the um, males in the college study that was done had participated in, in oral sex. And if the intellectually gifted do it, can the rest be far behind? Pun not intended. Many psychotherapists consider both acts to be, to be quite normal. Um, in the 1960s, as I said, states began to, to uh, repeal oral sex prohibitions among consenting adults. Um, and um, over 70% of them had been removed by the time the Supreme Court actually banned it or struck down such laws entirely uh, back in 2003. Um, 
Another way in which we can, can involve ourselves in sec sex involves pornography. We define pornography essentially as explicit material that has no artistic or literary value and may be harmful, um, not psychologically per se, well, uh, perhaps psychologically. What I'm, what I'm talking about here is it's not physically harmful, uh, but by portraying women in, as inferiors or in an inferior sexual position, that might lead to um, uh, some judging it to be, to be harmful in and of itself. There are a number of different controversies surrounding pornography. Is there any artistic value? What constitutes harmfulness as we're talking about it here? Males are overwhelming consumers of pornography. They use books, magazines, videotapes, etc., as stimulants in, in um, masturbation, uh, conceded even by magazine editors, interestingly enough. Um, most sexually explicit films, if you think about it, are photographed from the male's perspective, uh, focusing on the woman and her reactions to the sex act that's going on. Note, for instance, that females' primary and secondary sexual organs are often shown on TV late at night on any of the premium channels, uh, and yet by contrast, males' organs are rarely shown but there is absolutely no legal proscription against doing so. It is simply social preference or social demand that leads to that situation. There's no legal reason why you have to do so. Women generally report little or no interest in erotica, and yet the research indicates that women respond just as strongly to um, explicit sexual materials as do men. Um, what I will do is simply stop the lecture at this point. I have a series of comments that I also wanted to make following up or concluding what we were talking about. So we'll simply stop in Sexuality 2 and we'll have a mini version of Sexuality 3 at the beginning of the next tape.